We're going to move on now to our next guest this morning, and he is, uh, frankly, a living legend. I probably learned more from listening to our next guest than I have from virtually any other investor in the country. And he's able to make things clear. He's able to make them funny. He's very approachable. And I'm telling you, you're going to come away with some great ideas. He's here. His name is Mario Gabelli, and he's here to share what he sees as long-term opportunities in investing in infrastructure and beyond. And uh, conducting the conversation is my good friend and Squawk Box co-anchor, Becky Quick. Hi, Becky. Hi, Mario. Hey, Tyler. Thanks for that intro. Really and hope the Knicks win today. a few games this year. <laughs> and Becky, our Mario Gabelli is somebody I've been listening to for a very long time, too. And, and Mario, thank you for joining us today. I, I know that when it comes to financial advice, it, it it, it takes a lot to kind of figure out what's going on. You got to look at the big picture and then you have to drill down. And um, I know you are a bottoms up guy, but you are also have to be looking at all of the things that could be changing right now in the big picture. So maybe you can walk us through, first of all, what you see happening with the big picture, with the election, with the pandemic, and what you anticipate from companies over the next year or so. Well, uh, you know, that's a great at research uh, with a great deal of intensity. We put companies under a microscope and we look at them also with the point of view of a telescope. What's going on today? What's going on in the future? What's the present value of the future stream of earnings? How can they protect their business and how do they allocate cash flow? From the uh, election's point of view, you know, I thank all my Democratic friends. I thank all my Republican friends for putting money into the campaigns because they are spending a lot on broadcasters, which we own a lot. Uh, our share of. From the point of view of the election, uh, clearly from my uh, perspective, I worry about who will be appointed to succeed the two J's. Who's going to succeed what you just heard from Jay Clayton? Who's going to succeed Jay Powell? Who's going to succeed the Federal Communications Commission chairman? Pa and then obviously there are other issues that deal with that. From the economy's point of view, Becky, uh, I take the point of view that we have a GDP at uh, 20 21 of 91 trillion dollars based on the uh, global GDP from the IMF. Of that amount, the United States is 24 percent. China is 18.5 percent. Europe is around uh, 22 percent. Japan, six. So if I look at China and Japan, I see good growth in 2021. In the United States, I see extraordinarily good growth, even with the uh, issue that we raised about the pandemic. And that is because of a long runway for uh, automobiles, a long runway for housing. And I see some uh, return of spending in terms of uh, commercial aviation, particularly the MAX coming back on production starting in the second half of 2021. So I'm uh, on a longer term basis, but let's stay with 2021 for the FAs that are listening. The economy, uh, revenues up four to six percent for a typical company. Uh, gross margins are going to be narrowed because of high uh, logistic uh, issues and also high PP uh, for personal protection issues. SG&A will be maintained. Margins will decline a little, but the taxes are likely to go up. Uh, and then the uh, question is the multiple on earnings. So before we get to that, though, cash flow, the, the, the present value of, of the discount factor on pensions is that declining which means the liability is increasing, which means cash flow into the defined benefits is going to rise. So there's some uh, pluses and minus. Bottom line, you know, I think the markets have discounted a portion of that. Uh, short term, obviously, you have the question marks of what's going to happen. I've taken the point of view that we have a W with a swoosh, and that is that the Fed will keep rates low for a period of time. But over time, and uh, rates will rise. So if, if I go back 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 1980, the 10-year was 14 and 7 eighths. Today, it's 70 basis points, plus or minus. So what's going to happen to multiples when th those rates invariably rise to reflect the underlying inflation? So, Becky, that's it on the economy. And, the, uh, and I think you buy an ETF for a client, you're going to make 6 to 8% over the next 10 years. And I think that's pretty good. Yeah. I, just to follow up on, on a few of the things you just said, in terms of the election, you're looking for the successors to Jay Clayton, Jay Powell, and Ajit Pai. Does that mean you think that um, it's definitely going to be a Biden presidency? No, but I think that uh, it's already been announced. Jay, I think, is going to move on after th this term is up. Uh, he's done a lot. He's been very, uh, you heard him before. He's done a terrific job in a lot of areas. I would just like to add one uh, arrow in his quiver. 
I would like those companies that buy debt to control a company, the distressed debt, for example, what you heard about in Hertz, what you're hearing about in Garrett, what you're hearing in other companies, I'd like them to just put that data in a fishbowl, file a 13D the same way I as an equity holder have to do. Uh, from the point of view of uh, a GPI, yes, that would be an issue. I, I assume that that requires that uh, uh, Biden would win and uh, he would retire from the Federal Communications Commission. And he's done a terrific job of bringing broadband to rural America. Just like in the 1930s, we brought electricity to rural America, just like we bought POTS, plain old telephone service. Today, we have to bring broadband. So that would be of an, an issue, Becky, that I would be concerned about. So when you start and, uh, uh, from the saying point some of these of things, I guess that's... A question about the pandemic, you know, I take the point of view, mm -hmm. Becky, that we have the following. Number one, you think about smallpox. We solved the problem. You think about uh, polio. We solved the problem. You think about HIV. We solved the problem. We think about Ebola. We contained it. Malaria. We're working on it. Measles. The challenge is people. Will they get the shots when they uh, come up with solutions? So <laughs> I, I'm very optimistic that we will have a, a a vaccine to contain this particular uh, outbreak and uh, you know we'll move on from there somewhere in the next 12 to 18 months. You know uh, Mario you said that we'll move on from there and and you can kind of look through some of these things but when we spoke yesterday you did talk a little bit about how it has fast forward digitization um, and, and, and it's done that in a way that that maybe people couldn't have guessed before how quickly things would be changing. How, how do you kind of put that into the sectors that you're looking at that could see big growth as a result? Well, that's a, a good opening question for me. And that is, if I look back at 100 years ago when we had the, pan, the Spanish flu, uh, we were also in the midst of a uh, significant surge in the world going from the farm economy to an industrial economy. And the Industrial Revolution took place and was, you know, well along. Today, we have the digital revolution. It's been unfolding, but the direct to the consumer, the changes that are taking place, the embedded changes in, in the habits of individuals, I think that's been accelerated. The notion of remote uh, learning, the notion of remote uh, work, uh, uh, those are embedded. I don't go shopping at Costco without checking the price on Amazon on what I'm paying for Costco. I asked my wife to do that, but that's a different <laughs> issue. And so from that point of view, the price discovery is important. The ability to have uh, the consumer change habits. Netflix, uh, as an example, bypassing the theaters, but yet needing the theaters at some point uh, for a variety of reasons. All of that uh, working together. So we have to uh, adjust to that. And then the question is, what's the value? A good example is a company, uh, uh, Nicola. Uh, the stock is selling today at about $20. as a $8 billion market cap. And uh, when I look at Navistar, which is a terrific company, Trayton, which is a spinoff from uh, Volkswagen of their Class 8 market, big heavy trucks, basically they're saying, you know, I'm, I'm arm wrestling over $1.50. So instead of paying, they're paying $43.50. That's a four and a half billion market cap. So I look at what is the relative values of businesses that I want for my clients to own 100 percent of, and how do I make money over the next two or three years? And then obviously you got to. <laughs> keep what you make and what are the taxes going to be. Right. And, and, and let's talk about that. You, you mentioned that you're the type of guy who, before he goes to Costco, looks to price check everything you're going to buy on Amazon first because you are a value guy. You have always been a value guy. But it's really the growth stocks that have performed so well under the scenarios that we've been watching this year. I, I know even in the Gabelli funds, the growth stocks have far outperformed the, the value funds. So how do you kind of assess and look around? That? Am, Is that a trend that you think will continue? I, there's no question that our growth team led by Howard Ward and his uh, team is uh, up 30 percent of the value guys are probably down three to five, which is the largest discrepancy from the point of view of small companies, from the point of view of uh, uh, opportunities with cyclical sensitivity. What's going to work? How do I find companies that are going to make two or three times and I must admit that uh, I did not think uh, Jeff Bezos' stock would go from a trillion to two trillion dollars of market value in as short a period of time. But we like growth. It's, the question is, where, what is my margin of safety when I look at that? So from the stock market's point of view, what is the margin of safety going into 2021? Uh, and from the stock selection point of view, 
we're finding companies that were going to make two or three times our money, whether it's in particular sectors or standalone companies. We tend to be more uh, interested in standalone. So growth is good. Uh, and uh, the question is, what do I want to own in that category? And But more importantly, can I buy it at what I would like to do, uh, which is a margin of safety? But, Mario, so, back uh, to my point, the, though, that is, framework, is there going Becky, to be a time... In terms of where I see the world changing and where there's continuing uh, change, and you just heard Jay Clayton talk about the environment, we love our planet, mm -hmm. we love uh, the people. So the notion of dealing with the environment and dealing with climate change and dealing with, you know, uh, a, a variety of dynamics, how do I pl participate for that in clients, client portfolios? And we have taxable, tax-free clients. We have 1,800 separately managed. We have mutual funds and so on. And we spun off our hedge fund business and private equity. But in that context, essentially, we're looking at the environment, climate. How do we get renewables, wind, solar? And then how do you transmit that from the place where the wind is or the sun is? So you need batteries and you need uh, transmission equipment. And then in addition to that, you do need to protect that environment with cybersecurity. So when we get that combination, what companies are we buying? We're buying a company located in uh, Connecticut called Avon Grid. There's 300 million shares. The stock's around 54.5. It's uh, 250 million shares are controlled by Iberdrola. They're very good in renewables, and they're going to put greater emphasis on that. Down to uh, Florida, you go to Juno and you see Nextera. But Nextera Energy Partners, I think they have 165 million shares. The stock's around 55 as well. And now it could be a little higher, 63 or 4. And basically, that's their uh, power development company. And we want to own that. We do. Now, Nextera has been uh, a super uh, uh, $200 uh, uh, dollars a share uh, plus. And so, what else do we like in that area? Transmission. Who makes the equipment for the grid? How do we reinforce the grid? Look what happened in Louisiana with those poles that came down. Look what happened in uh, California with the fires. How do we find companies like AZZ? How do we find Valmont? How do we make the equipment that's going to be structurally sound? How do we galvanize it with companies like I mentioned AZZ? So, those are the things that we're looking at there. Secondly, secondly, back in the 1960s, there was a hot, sexy movie called The Graduate. And The Graduate had Dustin Hoffman and uh, Anne Bancroft. And the scene that reminds uh, most of us of a certain age, there's a great future in plastic. Well, the future today, Becky, is recycling plastic. So the companies that we follow, my analyst, Hannah Howard, follows the companies like Ada, uh, Silgan in Connecticut, uh, Crown, which reported this morning, and Ball Corp. And we like the metal cans. And I had a can of uh, LaCroix here that I was going to show as opposed to a bottle of water. <laughs> but independent of that... Uh, we can do that later. Uh, the uh, second part is uh, uh, the waste companies. Uh, you know, Casella was almost bankrupt a few, uh, uh, financially stressed a couple of years ago. Stock's gone from 6 to 60. Uh, what companies are helping the recycling of this product so that we don't dump it into the ocean? So those are some of the things we're thinking about in that notion of love our planet. And then our people. Should we convert over from uh, plant pro uh, from uh, 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 animal protein to plant protein. Do I find a company in Canada called uh, Maple Leaf Foods? The stock's 1850 U.S., uh, 20 odd dollars in Canadian. I think they're going to do a terrific job to return money. They're better known for Canadian pork, but they're setting up a Beyond Meat type capability in the U.S. So that's what we're looking at, and that's where we're looking and including in, in that area. Uh, folks, in the audience, if you have questions, you can go ahead and send them in on the chat. We may have a couple of minutes at the end of the interview to get to those. Uh, but, but, Mario, in the meantime, you mentioned something at the top about how you're looking for aviation to make a return. Um, obviously, more people are starting to feel comfortable flying, but even the airlines themselves and Boeing have said that they don't anticipate seeing the same levels that we saw of pre-pandemic travel for quite some time to come. It, it's going to take years, they think, for that to come back. Is that a view you share? You think uh, these stocks are just so undervalued now that it makes it worth it anyway? Or do you think that people will actually start traveling uh, more frequently, more quickly? Uh, we basically will have a certain number of planes that have to be replaced in the fleet. And from that point of view, what happens in 2022, 2023, 
is what we're looking forward to. So look at China, for example. I'm going to cuff the numbers. 1.4 billion people, high propensity to travel. They're traveling domestically. Will they, with the new president or uh, whoever's president, uh, be basically buying uh, U.S. equipment? What do they need to fly from, uh, uh, let's say, uh, Beijing to uh, Macau? Or that's not the right place, but Guangzhou. And uh, what kind of equipment? Will they be buying the Max? And I think they will. And so that's one big part. But no question that it'll take three or four years to come back. You know, the banks are down 30 percent this year. The travel and leisure related companies are down sharply. Oil is down significantly. So the, those kinds of companies are intriguing to us because we ask the simple questions. How bad is bad? How long will it be bad? And then how good will it get? And how, who will be the companies that prosper in that environment? And so we're looking and culling through our holdings and looking at that. And we have conferences on this. We had 30 years of conferences on vendors to Boeing and Airbus. In fact, next uh, in 10 days, we're going to have a conference virtual on uh, the auto industry. 44 years. Last year, we emphasized uh, the replacement used car market like Carvana, uh, what Auto Nation is doing, what is doing with CarMax. Then this time around, uh, we're looking at the whole subject of the battery. What is the who has got the battery? Who's got the components of the battery? How does that work? And how does that fit into the EV of the future, which is part of what we talked about in climate change? So those are the uh, that. W so going back to your question, uh, yes, we're looking. Yes, we're uh, very interested. And we're looking out 18 months. And if capital gains rates uh, stay the same, you uh, obviously will keep more of what you earn. There is some chat that's been taking place uh, at the conference this morning. Just. With, with some of the FAs who are here this morning about how it's inevitable that taxes are going to be, go up. That's the view of a lot of people here. So realistically, what could happen to tax policy in a Joe Biden administration if there is a Democratic sweep? That's a great, uh, another interesting point, because what I didn't talk about in terms of my model is that if I take the 21 percent uh, tax for book and what's the cash tax, what they should do and didn't do last time that they swept was, number one, eliminate carried interest. It is absolutely absurd that a private equity firm or someone can take uh, earnings of a, what is a W-2 nature and have it taxed at a 23.8 percent uh, capital gains rate. The second part is uh, obviously the deferrals on 1031, Section 31. If I had a stock that was involuntarily taken over, as I've had consistently over time, where Company A tries to buy it and does buy it and succeeds, my clients have to reinvest the money and pay a toll tax if they're taxable. Section 1031 allows the real estate uh, to uh, do that. What's wrong with that? Now, ETFs have an uh, 850, uh, without getting technical, there's a rule that allows them to pass through their gains, <laughs> and some of them do it like uh, uh, with a taxable. Uh, so bottom line, somebody has to level the playing field between uh, mutual funds and others and help the uh, individual shareholders to roll over that. From a tax point of view, most people are paying higher taxes if they live in New York, if they live in California, if they live in the uh, high tax states because of the non-deductibility of the salt tax. What are they going to do about the deductibility of state and local taxes? From a, federal, from a corporate point of view, I want companies that I talk to outside the United States to come into the United States. And the good news is they have territorial tax now versus global, which means they tax you where you're located, but not uh, uh, where, uh, from the point of view of the U.S., wherever you are in the world. And uh, those issues are going to be have to work out. Now, one final point on this, Becky, and somewhere in the February or March, whoever's elected is going to want to be reelected in the midterms. They're going to start running mm -hmm. all over again. Yeah. We got a 90 day break, maybe, before the election picks up and starts all over. Maybe, maybe give them 100 days of uh, love fest and being in Washington to uh, get their agenda started. <laughs> hey, Mary, there are some questions from the audience, and I, I hope you don't mind taking a few of these because uh, people have been listening pretty uh, intently to what you have to say. Richard Conrad writes in, he says, is there any upside for brick and mortar retailers like Nordstrom, which does a spectacular job online, is known for customer service, or is this a road to no return? Well, I don't know that industry well. Uh, you know, the one I've been following for a long time is uh, obviously Best Buy. And that stuck at a new high yesterday, converting and doing what they're doing. But from the point of view of bricks and mortars retailers, the way we have made money, and thanks to Carolina Jolly and my team, 
AutoZone, O'Reilly, uh, those are the companies, genuine parts that sell replacement parts to the 250 million cars on the road. They also, more importantly, have pricing power in case inflation picks up. So if you want to look at bricks and mortars retailings with a capability, uh, with the capability of going out and saying, you know, I have a 57 Chevy and I uh, live in the Bronx and uh, it's my car that I need a part, <laughs> they'll have it available within uh, a, a X number of minutes or an hour or two hours. So they have that core capability. So that's what I like in bricks and mortars. But good question, uh, not yeah, I, an area that I have any ca capability in. Yeah, I've used uh, the auto zones pretty frequently myself recently, <clears throat> and there's a line out the door every time I've gone. Um, Howard Klinker has a question, too. He says, will China be the leading economic force in the world? And if yes, when? Is that something you've looked at in terms of the big picture? Well, I look, from my point of view, smart people are smart people, okay? If the United States has 330 million people and 60 million are really passionate and hungry and driven, or poor, hungry and driven, uh, you know, that's terrific. And we have hungry and driven, or poor, hungry and driven, uh, you know, that's terrific. And we have saying we can do it, we will do it, and we're going to know how to do it. If you have the same percentage in China, that's 300 million people. And so, yeah, I mean, there's no question. Uh, but then the allocation of capital is different. You saw what unfortunately happened in France, where somebody just said, as a teacher, I'm going to give you an example of free speech. Well, do you have free speech in China? Do I have it in Hong Kong? Learn, you listen to Saturday Night Live in the United States. We have free speech. And uh, that's, what is, uh, that's what makes us different. And that's what has going to allow this country to continue to flourish. So... Uh, will China do well? Yes, I'm delighted. Look, they have 18.5% uh, of the world's GDP. Uh, hopefully they accelerate going th to a consumer sector. They're, we have 70% of our economy as the consumer. They're about 45 or 50%. So if they can grow that at 10% real, there's going to be a multiplier effect. They just have to learn how to blend their form of government uh, with uh, what is uh, not inappropriate for some other ways to do uh, 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 world trade. And they'll do well. But uh, as you heard Mario, from Jay Clayton, do I want to buy companies that don't have... To... Yeah, I got another question. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Finish that thought on Jay Clayton. No, I was going to... You know, the other things I'm doing is looking at, uh, obviously, the World Series and looking at sports and looking at what happened in basketball and looking at how to participate in that. So, you know, the betting, B-E-T-T-I-N-G, on sports is... Uh, we now have 22 states that allow it. Uh, four more are on Q, 18 have uh, approved it, 18 are actually functioning. How do I participate on betting of companies and sports and who's going to benefit? Obviously, we want to own the Atlanta Braves. They, you know, they, they finished okay. Uh, uh, Man U, Manchester United, we like to own uh, even the Madison Square Garden with the Knicks. Uh, and, uh, you know, we uh, also like Sinclair, which owns the regional sports network. So those are the things we like on the betting front. Uh, there are companies that are uh, like C uh, Caesars uh, are very attractive and they're uh, buying William Hill. Uh, GVC is interesting. Uh, and then in addition to that, obviously, Flutter with uh, Fox Sports, uh, Fox Bet and Churchill Downs. So there's a lot going on in the world of that new sector that we're looking at. But we I are about out of time, but I can't let you go without asking a quick question about uh, what you think about mergers and acquisitions. This has been an arena where you have been the king on this. You look at this as corporate lovemaking. What is the corporate lovemaking environment going to look like over the next year or so? Well, aside from the fact that SPACs are going to do a lot of deals and PE firms are going to try to harvest their gains because of the concern over taxes and do more club deals, the strategics, that is corporations that have the currency in part, are going to do more uh, acquisitions. You saw Teladoc make a significant acquisition of Livongo. In addition to that, Financial engineering, what did IBM announce? They're splitting off the company. Why? Because they think they get a better relative valuation. What did Barry Diller do? Uh, he spun off Match.com. What does Malone do in spinning off companies? What's going to happen with uh, AT&T and their content business? What's happening with Comcast with their uh, content business? What is Viacom going to do now that they're with CBS? So those kind of dynamics are taking place. And that will continue. And that is going to be an extraordinarily attractive way over the next six months to earn a return. The, getting in front of what 
someone else's uh, lovemaking is going to be. You saw Conoco Phillips doing Concho. You saw a couple of other companies uh, in, the, in certain industries. We expect a lot more in the utility area. In the infrastructure area, which we like, the uh, GVP is uh, 70 million shares. The stock's 22. Grace Construction Products. Grace Construction Products, GCP. Uh, Starboard came in and took control of the board. They're going to harvest this. So we look at those kind of dynamics, whether it's Aztec and the asphalt business or whether it's an equipment rental company like HRI. They're going to be taken over. So stay tuned for a lot of lovemaking. Merger Monday, Merger Tuesday, Merger Wednesday. It's going to happen. <laughs> Mario, thank you so much. I think that's uh, about an hour's worth of information crammed into 25 minutes. We appreciate the deep dive, and we thank you very much for uh, being yeah, with us today. It's yeah, great to see you. Thank you, and I look forward to seeing you in person at some point, including the next uh, Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting, maybe. Yeah, let's hope not in the not too distant future. Um, folks, thank you for your time. And Tyler, we'll send it back over to you.